Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Bigham from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so uh, fortunately, Mary gave this great introduction to my talk, or at least part of it. I'm going to talk about accessibility. But the other thing I want to talk about is to play, kind of play with this idea of loops. So you know, the, the theme of the conference is AI in the loop. You know, I've bristled in the past a little bit about kind of the ML community's new fascination with human in the loop. Like, humans are always in the loop. The, they decide the problems. They decide how we approach them. They decide the data we collect. They annotate it. They build the user interfaces. And they, they are the ultimate end users. But it turns out that both the ML and HCI communities actually do embrace this idea of loops. So we all know that progress is not made in pure linear fashion. We always kind of loop around. And so today I want to talk about this in the context of image descriptions, which Mary already introduced, um, tell you a bit, a, a bit about kind of the journey, not all only about convergence towards solutions, but also divergence in that pseudo-random path that we follow um, through this, and how it can help us uncover, re-remember, and better understand both the humans and the loops that we're enabling. All right, so loopy foundations. Um, so like I said, both HCI and AI know loops. But sometimes we're talking about different things. All right, so in HCI, we often talk about human-centered design, where we design, we prototype, and we evaluate. In ML, we talk about active learning, where we train a model, we figure out what kind of examples. We do a query. We figure out what examples might mess up that model. We collect and annotate that data, and then we append it to retrain the model, make it better. Uh, and then in interactive systems, um, we're often kind of interacting with the ML where the ML is making predictions. People are somehow in this loop where they're verifying, editing, erasing, getting rid of um, whatever it's done. And then we kind of go back and, and do it again. And so all of these kind of simplistic loops anyway think a lot about convergence. So we're all kind of converging towards our solution, our interaction. Um, but I also think it's really interesting to think about divergence. And so de design often thinks about divergence. And so you saw this with uh, Jody's talk where she mentioned the double diamond, right? So can we, we expand the ideas that are possible and then we kind of narrow in. And so I want to talk about how some of our uh, divergences can actually lead um, to more interesting and I, I think more profound ways to think about how people might want to um, solve problems or the people that are involved. Uh, and so I'm going to do this through uh, a very abbreviated version of 17 years of image description. So I realized when putting together this talk that I've actually worked on this problem for 17 years. Um, and it's a deceptively simple problem. So this idea of going from something visual to a textual description. And it's really useful for a variety of reasons. So people who are blind um, need access to images online, um, access to visual information out in the world. Uh, it turns out that a lot of uh, what we do as researchers is put our, our results into PDF documents, which are visual and only made accessible by um, image description. Even this talk, you wouldn't have known that there was a picture of a tree, and the description says a tree house and a big tree with a wide trunk and a ladder leading up to it, unless I described it. And so it's all over the place, and it's really important. In 2009, um, I created this iPhone app, which is pretty simple. It allowed users to take a picture, speak a question they want to know about that picture, and then the, the picture and question were sent off to crowd workers, and in a few tens of seconds, we were able to get answers back from people, not AI, uh, people um, to, to help make whatever people wanted to make accessible, accessible. And it got pretty popular. We had a couple thousand people use it, a few hundreds of thousands of questions answered. Um, and it gave us this really interesting loop between people and what they wanted to know, to that real world. So, they asked all kinds of things. They asked kind of like, what's the sky look, out, look like right now? You know, they asked like, how do I use this interface? So I just want to get coffee and it's got all these buttons. So how do I use this thing? And so people would try to describe that. So it's a credit card there. <laughs> um, you know, and basically what does this outfit look like? You know, fashion advice. We mentioned fashion before. Melissa mentioned fashion. Um, and you know, we had a lot of broken computers. So here's like a broken computer. Or basically, it's where the screen reader that a, a person who is blind would be using no longer works, and so needs some way to get access to it. So you take a picture of it and ask questions about it. Um, and then we also had um, pregnancy tests. So um, that's my last example. What does this test say? Um, and so a huge variety, and maybe not what you were expecting. Maybe that's what you expected to see, but maybe it's not what you expected to see. And so one of the things that we got out of this was that generic image descriptions weren't enough. Mary mentioned context. And so 
what we took from this was that uh, not a textual description often isn't enough to help a user uh, accomplish what they actually wanted to do. And so we went on a whole bunch of loopy convergences on um, specific subsets of these problems. So for instance, um, fashion, we had a whole project, you know, how do we enable people to get fashion uh, advice not from Mechanical Turk workers, but from people who might know what they're doing. Um, we had a whole, and we're still doing this, you know, how we had a whole pro set of projects using computer vision to interpret computers and graphical user interfaces to make those accessible, especially when developers haven't done that. Um, we didn't work on the pregnancy test, but we should have for multiple reasons, one of which that's, that's very important, but the other thing is you look at that test, and it's very similar to the COVID tests that were also inaccessible, which came up eight or 10 years later and became really uh, a, a bad accessibility problem. Um, one thing I'll talk a little bit more about is that coffee machine example. So we had all these interfaces out in the world. So we think about interfaces on our computer. There's a whole bunch of interfaces out in the world. They're also not accessible. So we went down this whole convergence toward a project on a project called VisLens, which seeked to make those accessible. And the idea was that um, a person would hold their phone up, they would uh, put their finger on a physical interface, and the system would tell them uh, what was underneath their finger. So that worked kind of like this. Fortunately, there's captions, so even if you can't hear it. Um, we even went as far as uh, helping people who are blind independently create tactile overlays so that they could take a picture of something with a whole a big process, convergence process. We were able to create a system that then enabled a person who was blind to create a tactile interface that they could then attach to a physical interface that they wanted to be able to use. So here's a, just a picture real quick of one of our participants attaching this tactile interface that they were able to produce. So, so for their microwave, all the buttons have um, braille labels on them. Um, it turns out though, this, this data set, so we had, like I mentioned, we had a whole bunch of questions. Um, it turns out that this data set ended up being really interesting and challenging and formed this other kind of loop, which was between us as sort of accessibility researchers and the computer vision research community. Uh, and so when we first started working on this in 2009, I talked to some computer vision colleagues like, that is way too hard. We can't answer arbitrary visual questions. Turns out a few years later, people got much more confident. Deep learning happened. Um, and so we were able to put this data set out. We're also able to work with uh, people like Debbie Parikh, who was able to um, use VizWiz as part of the motivation for visual question answering, which was this whole big challenge for the computer vision community. Donna Garari later turned this into a specific challenge with the VizWiz data set that, that we were able to put out. Um, and now we just had our fourth, um, our fourth um, VizWiz grand challenge where we challenge the computer vision research community to answer these questions, which are exactly the questions asked by people who were blind. And so we're kind of hopefully helping that loop happen. Um, we're also able via this data set to loop in developers um, with the real problems with users. And so um, our data set was able to influence in different ways, um, both Microsoft Seeing AI and Google Lookout, which are commercial projects which use computer vision to do a variety of things, one of which is to describe images. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean to produce useful, good descriptions? Um, and what would it mean to be designing um, those descriptions? And it seems like one of the ways you need to do that is designing data sets. So we talked a little bit in various places about how right now a lot of these features, including automatic text generation, are driven by metrics like blue and rouge and these things that kind of don't really capture the, the meaning behind the image. And so um, what I've noticed is that if you, really, if you take these text generation systems in particular, because they can generate so many different things, there's so many design problems that are essentially our design problems that come up as part of thinking through, well, how would you want the system to respond in a particular situation? And so one, I'd like to point out, because in some ways it's very small, but it's just illustrative of the myriad different kinds of problems you encounter, is uh, coffee versus tea. And so in VizWiz, we always gave people the instructions that you know, don't guess from pixels. You know, if you can't figure out the answer, kind of go up a level of abstraction. And so what would you do in this case if you can't tell coffee versus tea, which kind of looked similar even from the human perspective? Um, you might go up a level and say, well, it's a brown liquid. But from a perspective of trying to create a nice, delightful image description, saying it's a cup of brown liquid is not very appetizing. And so in this particular case, you might make the decision to go back and say, okay, let's re-annotate this. Let's not say brown liquid. Let's just take a guess at coffee and tea because getting it wrong isn't that bad. Once you start thinking about 
image description and the automatic generation of image descriptions in this design-oriented way, you start to immediately think, well, there are people in a lot of these images. How do we describe people? And so in some cases, maybe it doesn't matter too much. This is me and my student, Jason Wu. Uh, we just won the random distance run at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm very proud of it. Um, and so you might just say, you know, Jeff and Jason, uh, standing at the track. Um, in other cases, you know, you might have much more kind of serious questions about how you do this well. And so while in some cases it would be really uh, dangerous and potentially problematic or even harmful to describe someone's race or gender or um, other identity aspects that you can't even know from pixels. On the other hand, people who are sighted often make guesses all the time, and it can be kind of important. So what I have here on the screen is two articles, one about abortion and one about Black Lives Matter. Both of them are written by people who appear to be white males, and you might want to know that from that perspective when you're considering this article and what it has to say. Um, so in order to inv investigate this, we did a large interview study with people who were both screen reader users um, and also um, members of other marginalized communities about what uh, they would want out of race, gender, and disability representations in those text descriptions. And there's no easy answers here, but it does hint at it being really difficult. And some of the things that we could do to start making it so that, um, for instance, using people's names um, or making it more of an interactive system so that you know, the, the system doesn't just by default guess, um, but instead allows the user more power to interrogate. Um, finally, I, I, I don't want to ignore the content creators. Um, and so there's a lot of assistance that we believe ML and AI can do to help assist content creators in doing better. And so this is a picture of me the last time I was at Stanford a few years ago. Uh, my students included this in the uh, video they created about the system called Say It All where I d essentially did not say it all, so I did not visually, I did not describe all the visuals. So uh, we did a study, and you know, basically the audio captures are a lot harder. So there's this whole graph here, and I say basically the audio captures are a lot harder. Um, didn't describe all of the bars, other things. I'm not gonna do it today either, because look, I have 13 seconds, okay? But we have this other system. This is Amy Pavel speaking, which you probably can't hear. Um, but what it's doing is as it observes via the speech recognition, um, a person talking about different parts of the slides, it highlights those parts in uh, green so that you know, oh, I talked about this text or I talked about this image. Give people immediate feedback. All right, so my point is that there's a lot of different ways we can think about loops. I think we tend to think about the convergences, but I'm really interested in this idea of the convergence or divergences, where you converge a little bit, it reveals something new, and then you're able to turn that into a new problem or better understanding of people. And so 17 years from now, I might still be working on image description, but that might be okay if what I've done is I've learned a lot um, with all of my great colleagues more about the people and more about the loops that we can create to make um, technology better. So that's it. Thank you.